Good morning. My name is Craig. I'm on staff here at Arcade Church, and it's my privilege to open the Word of God to you. Um, my wife Debbie and I were gone last week, and I recognize, that especially at summertime, very few of us have perfect church attendance, at least at our home church. Uh, I, I just read some statistics this last week that said that uh, in America now, a churchgoer is someone who attends church once a month. And I hope that's not you. All right, I, I hope that's not you. But I recognize that you're gone. And, and I just gotta tell you, the moment that the, the singers and musicians, the, the downbeat, I don't know, is that what it's called in music, the downbeat, I guess, I don't know. Um, the moment the music started, I found myself quoting that theologian, Dorothy from Kansas. <laughs> There's no place like home. There is no place that I would rather be on a Sunday morning than hearing you sing praises. And, and today I had to hear you. I'm fighting a cough. I apologize in advance for any coughing that I'll do in the microphone. I wish it wasn't that way, uh, but um, I, I heard you singing and it was so, so beautiful. And I praise God for you. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, you reign and the earth rejoices, the coastlands are glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around you. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. You're so amazing and so great and so almighty that fire goes before you and it burns up all your adversaries. Your lightnings light up the world and the earth responds by trembling. Even the mountains melt like wax before you. The heavens, they proclaim your righteousness and all people see your glory. We praise you, O oh Lord, for all that you have done. We offer you adoration and worship and praise and confess that we do not deserve to be in your presence. We confess, Heavenly Father, that if it were not for the work of Jesus, the one that we just got through singing to, that we too would be melting like wax, that your fire would also be consuming us. And so we come before you not because we've been good this week, we come before you not because we won the battle for our particular pet sins. We come before you because of Jesus. And we thank you that you have allowed us into your presence to say lofty things that you so rightly deserve. And it's merely because of the work of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us in. Jesus, we thank you that you have saved us from our sins. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you indwell us and draw us ever closer to our Heavenly Father. And so, Father, it's because of that that you have told us that, that we can bring requests before you. And so, Father, I pray for marriages. For those of us who are married, it's hard. For those of us who are parents, it's hard. For those of us who are not married, it's hard. Bottom line, Lord, life in this world is hard. For those of us who are young, it's difficult. For those of us who are old, it's difficult. And so we come before you with aches and pains of our physical well-being. We come before you with aches and pains of our souls. And we agree, we long for you. We love you and we thank you. It made my heart sing, Lord God, to see these, these godly brothers and sisters on this platform as we commissioned them to go to LA. We know that you will do great things and that you will touch people's lives as they touch them down there, but we also know that you will touch our brothers and sisters as they go. And so we humbly ask, just as what Jen prayed, that you 
take them down there safely, you keep them safe, and you bring them home safely. Because we want to hear great stories of what you did. In the meantime, as we open our Bibles, would you please find us faithful, attentive, open to what your word has to teach us. In your son's holy and precious name, Jesus, amen. Amen. I don't know if you know, how, how long do you think 0. 0.40 seconds is? 0. 0.40, it's less than a half a second. When you say one, that's a second. So 0. 0.4 seconds would be w. 0. 0.4 seconds. 0. 0.4 seconds is how long a major league batter has to decide what they're gonna do with a 100 mile pitch coming across the plate. 0.4 seconds. When the pitch, when the ball leaves the pitcher's hand in the major leagues, and there are a lot of, lot of major league pitchers that can throw 100 miles an hour, and some of them over, the batter has less than half a second to make one of three possible decisions. One, swing, two, not swing, three, duck. <laughs> Point four seconds. And so we don't think for one moment that the batter is at the plate and they're getting ready and the pitch comes and they're going, well, now that's a dandy pitch. I think I'll swing. Or, you know, that's a bit outside. I think I'll let it go. Or it's coming to my ear. I'm going to duck. They don't have time for that. They don't have time for that. When I read that stat this past week, I thought of the Apostles' Creed. Because the, the world in which we live is coming at us 100 miles per hour. The world in which we live demands to know what we believe. In this so-called world of absolute tolerance, it's amazing how many people care about what Christians believe. And so when someone at the office, someone at the park this week, someone that you come and encounter with, and they will ask you, in essence, maybe even this question, what do you believe? Many times we freeze up. Thousands of sermons we've heard, maybe thousands of verses we memorized, and we just seize up. We just, we just don't know what to say. And part of the reason we're doing this Apostles' Creed this summer is for the sole purpose of knowing what to say knowing how to respond. What is at the center of our faith? What is it that we absolutely want to communicate to people about what we believe? And the Apostles' Creed, I think, is a wonderful way to do it. For those of you who might be here for the first time, the Apostles' Creed is probably the oldest and the simplest way of summarizing the Christian faith. There's evidence of it going all the way back to the second century. It's been around that long. Billions upon billions of Christians have recited the Apostles' Creed, spanning all races, all cultures, all denominational lines, some of them every Sunday, to remind themselves of what they believe. This morning, we are going to cover the second stanza of the Apostles' Creed. In fact, we're gonna spend three weeks on the second stanza of the Apostles' Creed because it addresses possibly, hang on here, I gotta turn this on, there we go possibly the most debated question in history. The most debated question in history is this, who is Jesus? I told you a couple of weeks ago that the Apostles' Creed has 109 words in it. 69 of those words are devoted to Jesus alone. Because that is the great question, that is the ultimate question that we are living, and that is so strange because Jesus doesn't tick off any of the boxes of influence, any of the boxes, any of the, of the boxes of what would make a person so memorable. I mean, you think about it, he lived in a backward town of Nazareth. He wasn't rich, he never wrote a book, he never ran for office, he never led an army, he didn't die a hero's death in battle, he didn't, wasn't married, didn't have kids, he didn't do any of the things that typically would make a person 
memorable, as memorable as Jesus. And yet, here's the thing. Currently, I don't know, I haven't looked at the last numbers. I'm not sure how they can even decide. But there are seven billion people in the world today. Seven billion people. Three billion of those people called Jesus Lord. Amen. And so, who is Jesus is a very significant thing because the, the weird thing about this, the other four billion, most of those people have opinions on who Jesus is. Everybody in any form of civilization knows about Jesus. And so who is he? And that's what we'll be devoting ourselves to. In fact, that was one of the key questions in the New Testament who do the crowd say that I am? Jesus said to the disciples. And they go through and they talk about, and the answer, John the Baptist, but others said Elijah, others that one of the prophets of old has risen. And so they're saying, everybody has an opinion as far as who Jesus is. And that's why it's vital that we look at the second stanza of the Apostles' Creed. Let's say it out loud, would you please? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. That's what we're gonna be covering this morning in the talk uh, because the Bible says some pretty, the Bible says some pretty incredible things about Jesus. I mean, John hits it right out of the gate in his gospel. In chapter one, when he says, verse one of chapter one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I think it's ironic that John begins his gospel with the same words that Genesis one begins with. In the beginning, God. This is that. I think I'll do that again. I think I'll say that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word we find out was Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word became flesh. That, became, that Word became a person. It wasn't a philosophy. It was an idea. It's a person. This person is Jesus. Well, this morning I want to just go through, and this might be an apologetic type sermon in the sense of defending the faith, um, but I'm hoping that as you take notes and maybe you just want to listen, you can do that. We want to be able to respond to this because the first question out of the gate for us is how do we know that Jesus is God? That's a pretty lofty term that Jesus is God. And I want to just give you three ideas on how we know this. First of all, Jesus did things only God can do. We have been slowly going through the Gospel of Matthew. We'll pick it up again in September. But this last stint, this last winter, when we were in, in uh, uh, Matthew, the, the middle chapters of Matthew, it seemed rapid fire. All of these miracles, all of these miracles going on. So list off, we'll just shout it, you know, this is crowdsourcing kind of thing. List out, what are some of the miracles that Jesus performed? Raising the dead. Lame Lame walk, water to wine. Raise the dead. Yeah, okay. Healing, pretty much everybody. Calm the storm. Forgave sins, resurrection. I mean, we could go on, right? We can go on to as far as all of these things that were happening is that Jesus did things that only God can do. And the reason why we know that is because of the Old Testament. Because God was doing many of those things in the Old Testament. Jesus came performing those kinds of miracles. But then also Jesus referred to himself as God and being one with God. And this is really what t- uh, upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious rulers of that time, is that Jesus was making statements about himself. For example, in John chapter 8, verse 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that phrase there is, is kind of a, it's a trigger phrase. It's going all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, when God is meeting Moses at the burning bush and Moses says, who do I tell people who you are? What's your name? And he uses Yahweh or I am. 
And so Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. I am. And so we understand, verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Here he is in the temple, the most sanctified, the most spiritual place uh, in the Jewish land is in the temple, and Jesus says, I am, I am. John chapter five. <clears throat> but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking, all seeking to, the more to kill him, uh, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which is a big deal, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. They knew the things that Jesus was saying. He was making these claims about himself right out of the gate. And we've talked about this, but it's been a while. If you're a skeptic, if you're thinking about maybe believing in Jesus, but the fact that because you love him and you think he's just a wonderful, tender, gentle person, you're absolutely right. He is all of those things, but he is far more than that. You've got to raise your sights because this is a person who is claiming to be God, not a God, but to claim to be the God. But then John's not done. I'm just using the Gospel of John. We can use some of Paul's writings too. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. If you knew me, you would know my father. These are, these are claims, and the Jews knew this. These are claims that Jesus is one with the father, that he is God. And as I mentioned earlier, we could go through a lot of Paul's writings, all the fullness of deity, dwell in him. We'll look at another couple of passages from Hebrews here in a second. But all of these are talking about the fact that it's not good enough, it does not suffice for us to simply say Jesus was a good man. Because he wouldn't even allow us to say that. He is so much more than that. I know I'm going through these things quickly, but I'm hoping that that will spurt uh, some uh, uh, conversations with you. The New Testament writers speak plainly of Jesus' divinity. The New Testaments wrote all the time about Jesus. One of my favorite ones is in Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. What, what's, what's being, what are they talking about here? Talking about the Old Testament. Talking about Isaiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Jonah and Hosea, all of these prophets long ago. That's, that's how God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, we are in the last days. They were in the last days. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his what? By his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the, who's, who's the he? Once again, just, it's Jesus, okay? He, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the, <coughs> the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I can't think of a better description of the deity of Jesus Christ than words of radiance. We've talked about this once again before, but this whole idea of he sat down at the right hand. It's interesting because in the Old Testament tabernacle, as well as in the, uh, the temple of the New Testament in Jerusalem, we tend to think that the temple was like a church where you got people coming in and they sit down much like you sat down. Well, in the temple, there was no such furniture, there was no chair. It was empty of any kind of chair, and so when the priests were going into the temple, they were always on the move because there was always work to do, and the reason why there was always work to do is because there was always sin to confess and atone for. There was a constant movement of priests because there was a constant movement of sin. It never stopped. That's why this is so significant here, is that when Jesus purified us from our sins, what did he do? 
He sat down as a way of saying, the work is done. It's over. There is now no more bulls, no more calves, no more pigeons, no more goats need to shed blood for the remission of sins because Jesus Christ has purified us and that work is finished. That work is done. He sat down. That's what you do when the job is done, right? You sit down. That's what Jesus did. He sat down at the right hand of the Father the majesty on high. It's beautiful imagery. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but I hope to find out when we get to heaven. The point of Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 is that regular human beings don't do that stuff. You can't say that about someone who's a regular human being. Jesus Christ is God. Well, how do we know that Jesus was fully human? We're not going to look up a bunch of passages here, but we're just going to talk about this quickly because we... We embrace that. That, That's not a problem for us to embrace Jesus' humanity. For example, number one, he was born and grew up. Jesus played. He learned. He didn't just, he wasn't born and at six months old, he's writing everything in Hebrew. He learned as many times your children learned. He skinned his knee. He, He played the Jewish version of duck, duck, goose, whatever that is. He did the normal things that normal children of that time did. He grew up. He had a child. He was grew up. He was born and grew up. He was born, grew up. He knew what it was like to be human. He knew what it was like to be human. He would get hungry and he would need food. He would get tired and he would need rest. He would get agitated at people and he'd need to calm down. He experienced all of the things that you and I experience emotionally throughout the course of the day is that he knew what it was like to be human. He knew the battles that we face internally. He knew about those things. He was aware of those things. But then third, he knew what it was like to suffer. He knew what it was like to suffer physically. He probably knew what it was like to suffer emotionally. The Bible does not talk about his earthly father, Joseph, past the Christmas story, or a little bit beyond the Christmas story. When Jesus gets lost in the temple, Joseph is alive, but somewhere between Jesus being 12 and Jesus being crucified, there's no evidence of Joseph, and so we assume that he has died. And so Jesus was well aware of grief. He was well aware of loss. He was well aware of all those things that you and I experience on a daily basis. But then also, he knew what it's like to suffer. And most in this room don't struggle with what we just talked about. We don't struggle with the deity of Christ and we don't struggle with the humanity of Christ. We can stockpile verses that talk about his deity and we can stockpile verses that talk about his humanity. The problem is this. How does Jesus' divinity and humanity exist together? How is it the Bible says that Jesus was fully man and fully God and be that at the same time. How did those two dynamics exist? And for the first 500 years of the church, this was the major topic of conversation. Athanasius, who, was, who lived in the fourth century, who was part of a lot of controversies, and we'll talk about that in a moment, he said you couldn't go to the market to buy a piece of fruit and not have someone talk to you about the identity of Jesus. It was that frequent. That was the number one topic that people talked about. I have a book I want to recommend to you. Um, it's, it's a great book written by Dr. Todd Miles, who is a professor at Western Seminary. It's a seminary that we partner with. Uh, many of our people have gone there and taken classes and things. Uh, this is a great book, though. Superheroes Can't Save You. Young people, I would say it's a great book for you to read. I think that you would enjoy it. Because what Dr. Miles does, he goes through and talks about the heresies that the church faced at that time, about how we face those now, but then what he does is he takes a superhero to match it with that particular heresy. It's very interesting, borderline entertaining, because you're talking about, in fact, I became a voracious reader by reading comic books about superheroes. 
I mean, that's how I became a reader. I just, I just loved to, to read that stuff. And so this is a very refreshing book, and talk, Todd Miles does a great job talking about that. So I want to talk about some heresies that the early church faced, and you might want to zoom out because, hey, we don't face that stuff. Oh, we do. We do today. For example, there's a heresy called docetism. This will not be on the exam, so don't worry about it. But that's what it was called back then, docetism. The belief was that Jesus was God disguised. All right, Jesus is God. They have no problem with his deity, but he wasn't really a man. He was just disguised as a man. Modern equivalent, uh, Christians who diminish his humanity. That's the modern, people that diminish Christ's humanity and say he was more God than he was man, they would be a dos- that would be a docetist. All right, so who would be the superhero comparison? Who would compare? He was, he was disguised as a man, but he really wasn't a man. What superhero do we know? Yeah, Superman. Mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent. Looks weak, looks meek, but he is Superman. Superman can't save you. Jesus is not God disguised. Here's another one. Heresy, adoptionism. This is the belief that Jesus was a regular man adopted by God. Jesus was just this, he was flesh and blood, he grew up, but then God bestowed power on him. And so he was adopted, he was adopted by God. Modern equivalent, Unitarians. Uh, one of our founding fathers, John Adams, his, his son, John Quincy Adams, were, were Unitarians in the sense that um, they did not believe that Jesus was God, but that he was a regular guy adopted by God. Ralph Waldo Emerson, if you've read any of his poetry or writings, you would know that. What superhero would adoptionism be? This is... This superhero is, if, if, if it's quiet, it's because we don't know. This is my least familiar green, uh, 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 superhero, Green Lantern. So I had to look up Green Lantern. Who, who is this guy? And Green Lantern was a normal, mild-mannered guy, normal guy who got a special ring or a lantern, and that, that lantern made him strong. And that's the view of Unitarianism, is that Jesus was just a regular dude, Regular Jewish guy growing up in Nazareth, Galilee, and then God bestowed on him the power that it took to be who God was. How about this heresy? Modalism. This is probably the most frequent in our culture. This is the belief there's only one God who merely changes modes. And so the Father is the Father, but he's not the Son of the Holy Spirit. The Son is the Son, but he's not the Father of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, not the Father or the Son. Someone does not like that modalism, and I agree. (laughs) I agree. Modern equivalent, oneness or Jesus only Pentecostals, and I want to make sure this is not all Pentecostals, but there is a sect within the Pentecostals where there is this oneness or Jesus only because the Father and the Spirit are wrapped up in Jesus. Also, the book, The Shack, helped a lot of people with a faulty view of God. God was this, then he's this baking cookies, then he's this weeding, then he's this, then he's this, then he's this, and meaning he's that, but he's not this. All right, and so that's modalism. What what superhero comparison would modalism be? How about this one, Ant-Man? Ant-Man. Ant-Man could be a gigantic giant, he can be as small as an ant, or he can be normal, but he couldn't be all three at the same time. Ant-Man. I know, you're just overwhelmed with amazement with this. (laughs) Another heresy, this is probably the most dominant one at the time, Arianism. Arius, by the way, was a worship pastor. You know those worship pastors. (laughs) Arianism. Jesus was created by the Father, which means that Jesus was someone less than the Father. Jesus was created by the, he was fully God, fully man, but he was created less than the Father, and so he wasn't as full 
as the Bible teaches. The modern equivalent, in fact, I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door and we talk about the Council of Nicaea where Arianism was, do, uh, was deemed as a heresy. And they say right out of the gate, yeah, we're Arians. We believe that Jesus is someone less than God. What superhero here? What would be the hero? Someone that was created by the Father. What would be a superhero? Yeah, someone said Thor. All, all of you don't, you, you read the same things, don't you? Yeah, Thor. Thor got his power from where? Odin. He got his power, his creativity, his strength, the hammer. He got everything from Odin. He gets it from, but he's not the father. He's something less than the father. Okay, I know that you just gripped by this, but one more. Liberalism. Ah, those liberals. We're not talking about red states, blue states. Belief. Jesus was merely remarkable. And I, I, I use the word merely. He was merely remarkable. Modern equivalent, the Jesus Seminar. This is a group of so-called scholars that got together and tried to take everything out of the Gospels that did not seem reasonable. So you, you got a pretty thin Bible when you do that. All right. Jesus is my homeboy. We've got that. That's not so much a thing nowadays, but a lot of t-shirts. Basically just minimizing the deity of Jesus and saying, hey, fist bump, Jesus is cool, Jesus is my homeboy, and we completely deny the deity that this is almighty God in the flesh. Superhero comparison, huh? Jesus was merely a remarkable, was merely remarkable. Who would be the superhero comparison? Any ideas? I am Batman. <laughs> Batman, just a re remarkable guy, remarkable guy. I use that, yeah, to, to get some grins and stuff, but to, to note, to say this, there are things and there are belief systems out there that diminish the deity of Christ or they diminish the humanity of Christ. And we've got to be careful about all of them. It's not that we go and look for a heretic behind every bush, but all of a sudden we begin to find out that who is Jesus is an incredibly important question to respond to. And that's what the Apostles' Creed does. I love this quote by our good friend Jaya Packers with Jesus right now, but he said this, at the moment of Jesus, <clears throat> at the moment of Jesus' conception, the divine nature of the eternal person of the Son was united to our human nature. Therefore, Jesus Christ is fully and truly both divine, human, but without sin. His two natures are united without division, separation, mixture, or change. This is significant for us because the culture wants us to diminish. You see, this is, the culture would be more than happy for us to just simply say, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They're happy with that. They're okay with a Jesus who says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Where our culture takes exception is the next phrase that Jesus says. No one comes to me except through the Father. No one. And then all of a sudden, the line of separation drawn. And we must believe that and hold, hold that. Well, that's the first part. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. But there's more to it as well, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. And we're not going to spend a ton of time on this one. But I do want to read just a portion out of Luke 1. And you're going to start wanting to hum Christmas carols because that's usually only the only time that we ever look at this passage, but it's a beautiful passage. In fact, if you don't wanna look up and just bow your head and close your eyes, just let me read this to you, this, this dialogue that Mary has with an angel. In the sixth month, <coughs> the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. 
And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. In the Bible, there are many miraculous births. I think of Sarah. I think of Rachel. I think of Hannah. I think of Samson's mom. But this is the miracle of all miracles for us, is that Jesus Christ is this in the flesh. So I'm trying to respond to the question I'm thinking that maybe the more of a skeptical of us might ask is why does this matter? What does it matter that we precisely know who Jesus is, that he is fully God and that he is fully man. Well, here's why. First of all, what happens if we minimize Jesus' humanity? Just think about that for a moment. What happens if we go along with one of the heresies that we just talked about and we just say, it's easier for me to believe that Jesus was all God and a little bit human? What would happen if we minimize Jesus' humanity? I think we would have a problem with that. Hebrews chapter two says this, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. It's important for us to know that the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook what? Of the flesh and blood. He goes on, those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He helps us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in how many respects? In every respect, (coughs) so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus had to be for him to do what he did. He had to be human so that we could identify with his humanity, so that we know that whatever he experienced, we experienced, and whatever we experienced, he experienced. But if we diminish that, if we just file him away as being merely human, but he's all God, but he's less something less than human, then there's no way that he could ever identify with us. And this word propitiation, it just simply means that Jesus was sufficient to take all of the judgment, all of the wrath that was stored up against us upon himself. He took the wrath of God that was geared for you upon himself. He took the judgment of God that was reserved for you and for me upon himself. He was a man who could be able to do that. (coughs) For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. If Jesus was something less than human, this would be the sickest joke in the universe. If if, If it's true that Jesus was something less than human, but he was all God, then we have all been punked by God. And he's having a really grand old laugh at our expense. But that's why it is significant that we know because whatever you have experienced, whatever abuse, whatever pain, whatever betrayal, whatever rejection you have experienced in your life, you have a Lord and Savior who knows exactly what that is. Say amen some more so I can take a drink. Thank you. That's significant. What happens? What happens if we diminish or minimize Jesus' deity? (coughs) Think about that. What happens if we minimize his humanity? What happens if we minimize Jesus' deity? (coughs) 
<coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'll, I'll be quitting here in a second. <clears throat> if Jesus' divinity is diminished, then there is no way that he would be our mediator before God. There's no way that a mere mortal would go before a righteous God on behalf of others. That's exactly what he has done. First Timothy 2. <coughs> For there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men. The man. The man. Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus, is our mediator. So, brothers and sisters of RK Church, what do you believe? The purpose of the Apostles' Creed is to help us re rehearse what we are willing to die for. There are other things to believe about the Bible, about God, but at the core in the center, these truths are what we live for and what we die for. There have been millions of Christians who have been reciting this very creed as the sword comes down on them. So let's stand together. <coughs> Christian, what do you believe? Would you join with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried and descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a holy Catholic church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If this is something that you, maybe you have just confessed for the first time, I want you to know, we want to get to know you. We want to love you and we want to pray for you, pray over you. There will be some elders and their spouses up front. We would love to talk to you about these truths and how wonderful they are. If you're at home, we'd love to see you here next week. But we also recognize that many of you can't get out and so we would love to know how we can pray for you. And you can email us, info at arcadechurchonline.com and we'd love to talk with you and pray for you. In the meantime, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, that together with one voice you may glorify the God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you can finish it. And we all say together, <coughs> I love you, have a good day.